Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me, and we got a lot to cover. We got draft this week, superstar trades, off-season rumors, and you know we're going to cover it all in today's episode of the podcast. But as always, got to start off as we always do. How are we doing today, Dame? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. A lot of news, a lot of stuff going on in the NBA. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about this. I feel like we, we didn't do a pod in a little minute. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely excited. Definitely got more than enough <laughs> to cover one podcast episode where we could probably go for hours um, right. to do all the, the news that's been coming out um, over the last week and the drafts coming this, this Thursday um, and all the trades that are rumored. So much smoke going on around the league. You don't know what's real, what's fake. So this is some of the best time of the year for that that off-the-court drama um, to, to kind of go through. One of the best times is just an NBA fan because everybody loves shaking stuff up, right? You want to want to see new things, new teams, um, new players in new places, and, and we're getting that. So I'm going to go ahead and get the, the housekeeping out of the way. Um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you are watching on YouTube. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, um, go ahead and pre-download the show. It helps us out a ton. Go ahead and leave a five-star review. I checked again um, earlier this morning. We got listeners in the Netherlands now. So we <laughs> it's international stuff. We keep growing. We keep growing. So we appreciate all the support. If you're listening to this right now in the Netherlands, you're a real one. We appreciate you. Um, and without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it with the biggest news that's come out since we, we recorded Kevin Durant just can't stay away from the super team. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Bradley Beal is a Phoenix Sun. I feel like throughout this entire process of, you know, it's finally seeming like, you know, the Wizards are ready to move on from Bradley Beal. Obviously, with the no trade clause in his contract, he had a lot of, not a lot of, he did have the final say so <clears throat> um, in terms of where he would get traded to. Um, and it came out kind of late. There's a lot more teams that were speculated outside of Phoenix that seemed like more realistic destinations just based on the reports. Um, one of the biggest of those being Miami, but even, you know, teams like Milwaukee being mentioned there as well. Um, and, and it came out kind of late that Phoenix and Miami were the, the final two finalists there. Um, and, and shortly after that, Phoenix was able to, to close the deal. Um, the trade is technically not officially done. Um, cause I believe they're still trying to find a way, uh, potentially to maybe involve a third team to move Chris Paul again, essentially. Um, but for all intents and purposes, um, the, the details of the trade, obviously the, the, the Suns are getting Bradley Beal, um, and the Wizards are getting back Chris Paul, Landry Shamit, several second round picks and pick swaps as well. Um, the Suns will be also be getting guard Jordan Goodwin and forward Isaiah Todd as well. Um, so all that out of the way, um, just your initial reaction to the trade and the new big three in Phoenix of Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal. Well, if I'm being honest, when I first seen the trade, um, my initial thought is that's a lot of firepower, obviously. Like, just if we're just talking about it from a talent perspective, that is a lot of firepower. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of scoring for the Phoenix Suns. But when I, when I think about it, it's like, is that what they really needed? You know what I mean? Like they had, I, in my opinion, they had enough firepower. They had enough scoring between Devin Booker and KD in its own. So that, to the point where they didn't really need Bradley Beal. So that that part of it was a little confusing. Um, If I'm talking about the actual trade itself, like set aside the fit and everything, the trade itself is a, is a good trade for the Suns. If we're just talking about what did you get? What did you give up? They were going to cut Chris Paul anyway, for being honest. So mm -hmm. it's like, you replace him and Landry Shamit with a, uh, a guy that's capable of scoring 30 points every single night. So, I mean, from the trade itself, it's a good trade, but I just think that, to me, it doesn't address any of the problems that you had going into the offseason. And the fact that we just watched the Denver Nuggets with just two stars and a quality team around them win a championship and pretty much dominate their way through the, final, through the, the whole postseason, and you still make this move is a little bit confusing to me. So that part I don't really get um, from the Wizards side of it, man, the, Wiz to me, the Wizards are the definition of a poverty franchise, in my opinion. Like, <laughs> like, and it's not even the fact that you you trade him now 
Um, I, I, I understand his value isn't going to be that high because he has a no trade clause. The contract isn't that good. And he, he pretty much can choose wherever he wants. So it's like you're not going to get the best deal on the table if he doesn't want to go there. But you should have traded Bradley Beal years ago, in my opinion. Like extending him was a mistake. Giving him a no trade clause is ridiculous, in my opinion. Like I feel like the like there, there's people talking about it now. There's, I feel like there's only a couple guys in the league that should have a no trade clause, and Bradley Bill's not one of those guys, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But you should have traded Bradley Bill years ago. Like the writing has been on the wall. You've been trying to put a band aid over your 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 actual problem. You've been trying to stop. You've been trying to not go into the rebuild when you should have started rebuilding years ago. So to me, in my opinion, the Wizards. This definition of a poverty franchise. That was an insane move. But as far like I said, as far as the Suns, I just I, I just don't feel like it addressed any of the problems that they had going into this offseason. And it's made it way harder for them to address those problems now with this Bradley Bill trade. Yeah. Um I agree with pretty much everything you said, right? Same, same exact sentiment. When you see the trade initially, wow, it's a lot of firepower. Just again three guys who are capable of going off for 30-plus points regularly on a night-in, night-out basis. Great. Going – even going back to this trade deadline when they make the move for Kevin Durant, what was the number one thing that we talked about? Okay, well, you traded away your defenders to get him. You traded away a lot of depth to get him. When you got into the postseason, that is what hurt you. You had no real way to stop anything Denver was doing. Now, granted, clearly no one was able to stop what Denver was doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but even if we look back to that, you know, the Clippers series, the Clippers, even without Kawhi, were giving them some level of fits. And when Kawhi was there, they were able to get a game. Um, so... I still think there's a lot of issues there on the defensive end that, like you said, this does not address. Obviously, they have young guys on the roster. Like, they secretly got Darius Baisley last year, didn't play at all for them, I think. But, you know, he showed flashes in Oklahoma City of being a very versatile and capable defender, very athletic. Um, you know, Jonathan Goodwin is a – very quality point of attack defender is someone they got back in this trade. Again, those are good pieces to add, but there's still too many glaring holes from a complete roster perspective. When I know we've talked about on this podcast a ton of times, the teams that have been competing most consistently, you know, year in and year out for the last few years are teams that were built together over long periods of time. They're not cashing in their chips and going and get, you know, multiple superstars and, you know, leveraging the entirety of their bench to get them. They build quality benches. They have great role players. Everyone fits what they're trying to do, and that's when they find success. The most recent iterations of these conglomerate of superstars putting together, you know, top-end talent and just saying, well, we'll just force our hand that way. It's not looked as good in recent years. Obviously, injuries play a factor into that, but you've said this a ton. When you go that top heavy, it makes it that much harder to win when you lose one guy. Because mm -hmm. then there's not it, the the gap between your best players and your role players is significantly greater. So losing one guy hurts you that much more versus if you have a more cohesive roster, obviously it's still gonna hurt, but not to that same extent. So with that in mind, I've thought about it a ton. I don't feel like this trade moves the needle a ton for me for how I view Phoenix in terms of legitimate title contention. Obviously, with that level of talent, you're always going to be a very good regular season team. You're always going to be in the mix. But in terms of legitimate title contenders, I don't feel like that's change my opinion on Phoenix at all. I still have the same questions and issues. The caveat of that being they didn't have to give up DeAndre Aiden in this trade, which is in and of itself crazy. But again, when you have yeah. a no trade clause, you kind of can make the package. Right. So I would I'd be hard pressed to say that the Wizards didn't want DeAndre Aiden. I know that they did. But I'm sure Bradley Beal wanted to play with as much talent in Phoenix as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
uh, with that in mind, that then gives the Suns leverage to say, we can then move Aiden to get some of those quality role players to kind of fill out the rotation. Then it's like if you have John, or Jonathan Goodwin, Darius Baisley step up and they kind of can become quality role players. You get Tory Craig back. You might be able to get Josh Kogi back. This is a – that then moves the needle for me. But that's all TBD on what happens with DeAndre Ayton, what they're able to get back for him if they right. do end up moving him, which I think all signs point to they are and they should. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. that that has really run its course there. But if they're able to do that, to me, Phoenix becomes significantly more dangerous, which is, I think, weird to say when, you know, adding Bradley Beal doesn't, you know, check that box. But it's just – the holes in this roster to me are not solved by just saying, well, we'll just add more and more and more firepower. Cause that's great. But in the playoffs, it's very specific things that you're going to be asked to defend on a nightly basis. Teams are going to consistently throw things at you until they realize that you can't stop it. And if you aren't able to stop it, you will lose the series. I think mm-hmm. when we look at back at the finals, right. When we go to that, when we go to game three and you look at the Jamal Murray Jokic pick and roll, that was the most screens in game three that Jokic had set for Jamal Murray the entire season. They just were spamming ball screen action between the two of them. And Miami didn't have an answer to it. Miami didn't get another game after that point because they had no answer to stop one very specific action. Right. You do not have capable defenders and a capable defense. You don't have great rim protection. These are things that are going to get exploited by other top-level teams in the West. So right now, if they ran that series back, still think Denver would beat Phoenix, even with Bradley Beal. I don't think mm-hmm. offense was the issue. No, 100%. Um, my, the thing with Aiton, I feel like <clears> – <throat> excuse me. I feel like – I don't think that they, like sh- – like, I think they have to trade DeAndre Ayton. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not like a. I've seen takes like, oh, they can look for trades for DeAndre Ayton. If not, they can just keep him. I feel like with this move, you 100% have to trade DeAndre Ayton. Like, I don't. I think you're even worse. It's weird as it sounds. I think you're even worse if you keep DeAndre Ayton rather than trade him for players that are probably lesser of a talent, but can fill out the the roster a little bit more mm-hmm. and give you something that you actually could use that can help your team because. You don't need the 18 points per game that DeAndre is going to give you. You don't. You have Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, KD. You don't need any more scoring on this team in general. Like, you're fine as far as scoring. You've talked about this plenty of times. Without Chris Paul there, his offense drops off anyways because Chris Paul really elevates his offensive game. Mm-hmm. And the type of center DeAndre Ayton is, he's not going to give you what I feel like the Suns need. Like, I would like this Suns team a lot better if they had, like, a Mitchell Robinson, Kevon Looney, Robert, like, the, those type of gritty – I'm going to I'm going to hustle, I'm going to play defense, I'm going to get rebounds type of center rather than DeAndre Ayton. So in my opinion, I feel like they 100% have to trade DeAndre Ayton. Like I hate this move if they don't trade DeAndre Ayton. And that's why I'm I'm holding out my like as of right now, I don't really like the way this team is built, but I'm holding out hope for them that they're going to find a package out there that can give them something that they really need, but also I feel like after this playoff run after DeAndre Ayton struggles, after his even like off the court stuff with getting get it into it with Monty Williams, it's like, what is his trade value right now? Because I've seen people say like, oh yeah, they could just flip DeAndre Ayton for quality role players, two three quality role players. But it's like, what package out there? What what package is out there for you, DeAndre Ayton that has that's going to give you all of those pieces after the bad playoffs that he just had? He's on and a he's, max deal too. Exactly, he's on a max deal, getting getting paid like one of the top but three centers in the league and is playing less than an all-star caliber player right now. So, I mean, I don't really know what package is out there for him, but I would need to see it first to really have my full full assessment on the Suns team. Yeah, I think what you said about the type of center that the, that, that the Suns want to play with, a guy like Mitchell Robinson or Nick Claxton, someone that does not – need post touches mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like their offense vibes when he has to slow it down and get the ball on a low block touch to do this turnaround float shot um now like you said without chris paul 
his production to me drops off significantly. And I just don't know, like you said, what, what the trade market is for a max contract guy who is not playing remotely close to up to that level, is not in all-star conversations at all as mm-hmm. a former number one overall pick. Um, I think, it, again, like you said, it would be a great – Better for both parties, right? I think the Suns would get better if they can trade him and get any type of quality pieces back. And I think it's better for DeAndre Ayton to just go and get a fresh start, new change of scenery. Right. Um, so that how this trade is really going to be viewed is all contingent on what they do in the free agency, what they do in free agency and what they do with DeAndre Ayton. Um, because they have to make this roster more cohesive. Now, again – It'll be better that, you know, they're gonna they got a new coach. You know, I still don't think Monty getting rid of Monty was the right decision, but they have Frank Vogel now. He's gonna get a full offseason. Um, Kevin Durant's gonna get a full offseason there in Phoenix to, you know, really gel with everyone instead of kind of being thrown in at last second and got hurt. So he didn't really have any time before the playoffs really to to play with those guys in Phoenix. So all of those things are factors, but like you said everything is really hinging on what they do in free agency and what they do with DeAndre Ayton. So um, still TBD on how this trade is really going to play out. But as it stands today, June 21st, this did not move the needle that much for me. And it's like, even if they trade DeAndre Ayton, you have, I'd say, what are their their biggest problems? Defense, depth, they trade DeAndre and they're going to need bigs. And they still don't, they don't have a point guard. Is Devin Booker going to play point guard for them? I, I think that that's the thought process, right? Is you put D book at the one and uh, play Bill at the two and just let him be the lead facilitator, offensive creator for that team. But you're taking away from his biggest strength, which is scoring. It's like, I don't, I don't know. To me, it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Cause even if I like, I understand Booger played well um, in those games in the playoffs that Chris Paul missed. Like he played well running the point, still taking the offense, but I, his biggest strength is scoring to me. Like I don't, I wouldn't want to stray away from that if I'm the Phoenix Sun. So to me, that doesn't make sense. And that leaves more questions. Are they going to go out there and try to get a point guard? They need defense. So are they going to, are they going to go out there and try to get a wing that can play defense? They're going to need big. It's like, even if they find a package for Aiden for two, three players, I feel like it's going to be rare that they're going to find two, three players that address all of those needs, in my opinion. Yeah, they have they have a lot of work to do. So um, to be, like I said, they're already going to be a top, you know, they were top four seed in the West this year. Mm-hmm. They're going to be a top four, three seed in the West. They're going to be a great regular season team. Oh, yeah. They're going to win a lot of games. All right. My issue is going to come in the playoffs when teams are going to really look to exploit the weaknesses on that roster. And if they don't patch them up now, they're going to get exposed. And I do not see this Phoenix team making it out of the West unless no. they address those, those needs. Um, flipping over to the other side of things in this trade, Chris Paul is now on the Wizards. He's which, not playing a game on the Wizards, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, it was weird to even look at it in the jersey swap. Doesn't look right. <laughs> um, where where does Chris Paul go from here? So what I've seen was that they're trying to uh, make a package together to send him to the Clippers. But – that also is going to change when we probably talk about what we're going to talk about later on as far as their plans moving forward. So I don't know if that is going to be the same. Um, but yeah, I've the the most I've heard is the two LA teams, which is the Clippers and which is the Lakers. Mm-hmm. The more and more I think about it from the Lakers point, uh, the Lakers point of view. Um, I mean, if he's on a veteran minimum, I guess like it, it can it can work, but. I think I think it's just me being a Lakers fan, if I'm being completely honest. Like seeing my star players go through injuries and then seeing seeing Chris Paul's like injury history is just like, do I really want Chris Paul on the Lakers? But I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like he would be capped out at a certain amount of games that he would play in the regular season because you have to load manage him at this point. Like you have to save him for the playoffs. And even then he probably still is gonna get hurt, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Just the way his career has been. So 
I mean, on a veteran minimum, you have other players around him. Because on the Suns, he was a part of this big four, well, big three, before even before KD got there. He was like one of those core guys. I feel like if he goes to the Lakers, obviously you have LeBron, you have AD, you have Austin Reeves who could take um, ball handling duties away from him. So, like, you have other guys to the point where I don't feel like he's needed as much. He's not the only guy that can initiate the offense like he was for the Suns. So, I mean, the more and more I think about it, I don't. I definitely don't think it's a bad fit. I think it's just more of cross your fingers and hope that your 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 key guys doesn't get hurt. So, I mean, I don't think it's a bad fit. If the Clippers do want to run it back with the Kawhi and Paul George thing, fit wise on the court, I think it's I think it's a perfect fit on the court. The problem is obviously they don't play games. They they are never on the court. So I feel like yeah. that's their biggest problem. So between those two teams, um, we've talked about it before. The Celtics, I feel like that's a match made in heaven, in my opinion. I feel like that is the perfect fit. You have guys who are going to play games. Tatum and Brown, they don't really get injured much. They're young. They're in their prime. They're going to play games. You have great defenders around them so that he doesn't have to get – he can get hidden on the defensive side of the ball. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's a that's a beautiful fit. And he wants to contend, so I feel like those are the three contenders that I can really see him going to. I've seen some other teams, if he kind of wants to – like, if he like, I've seen the Spurs talked about before. And yeah, you know, Wimby, but it's like I don't think he wants to do that. Like, I don't think he wants to just ride his career out and not really contend for a championship. Right, he said he's addicted to the NBA Finals now. Right. Yeah. So I mean, one dose you get addicted. I didn't. That was a hell of a drug. That's crazy. <laughs> Ain't been back since. I mean, beat that addiction. But uh, yeah, like that wouldn't make sense for me for in my opinion, for him to go and be a vet on a young team, knowing that the biggest hole in Chris Paul's resume as an NBA player is the fact that he doesn't have a ring. Um, and it seems like that's something that he still obviously cares about and wants, and rightfully so. Um, so, yeah, I know we talked about the Boston fit last episode. I think that that one still makes a ton, a ton of sense. Um, they can find a way to get that done, whether that's even just him being waived and they can get him on a, you know, much smaller contract, even though a lot of his contract now is not guaranteed. Um, so I think that makes a ton of sense. The Clippers, I think, is interesting because um, they've been trying to, to see if they can get Westbrook back on kind of a hometown type of deal, um, take a pay cut. Um, and I would imagine then you basically have Russ as like a six man who can come in and play his way which maximizes his level um where he can come in as the only ball handler on the court and have the ball in his hands and continue to you know be aggressive make plays um and kind of command their second unit in that way and then you know however the game is flowing you then have options at the one um depending going into you know late stretches of the fourth quarter in terms of how what you need how either one of them have been playing it gives you a different mm-hmm. opportunity for for different looks there. So that's another one I think that that could be interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't think he spends a day in a wizard <laughs> jersey. That doesn't doesn't seem right. But no, not really. a lot of people said that about him in Oklahoma City. He ended up making that into a playoff team. So he he elevated that team. But listen, he just he can elevate your team. It's just he's not gonna play though and i feel like obviously he's a way different player than he was what was that at this point like what three four years ago like yeah, he's only gotten the bubble, over. right there's right they that was in, in the, the bubble, bubble yeah. yeah so i mean he's a he's an older player even more injured since then so I, at this point like you said i don't see him doing that whole it would be a real selfless move like if if he didn't care about winning a championship him going to the spurs and help it develop Wimby, help elevate Wimby, that would It'd be a great move for the Spurs. It'd be a great move for your your future franchise guy. But as far as Chris Paul, I don't think that that's what he wants to do at all. So, yeah. yeah. Um, looking back, bigger picture for the Wizards as a whole. Um, last season, Bradley Beal was basically he was really the second option behind Porzingis there in Washington. Which, um, for what it's worth, um, as a guy who was again pretty much the lead ball handler for them. Um, generated a lot of their offense, um, had one of his more efficient seasons in, in Washington. I think this was his first season over 50% from the field total. Um, one of his highest effective field goal percentage seasons, um, obviously a, a dip in terms of points per game, only putting up 23 a night. Um, we know he can 
you know, had multiple seasons of above 30% or 30 points a night. Um, mm-hmm. But obviously having to take less shots with Porzingis taking a greater role, we saw greater efficiency. Now he goes from being the number two option to the number three option. Um, so I think that that could elevate his efficiency and his, his scoring with a little bit less volume there. Um, but, you know, going back to the, the wizard side of things, um, I, you just got to like full reset. Right. Like Mm -hmm. at this point, I think you honestly should find a deal for Porzingis, who's coming off one of the better seasons of his career. Yes. Um, I think his trade value is probably as good as you're going to get it. You find a way to get a deal done for Porzingis and you just start from scratch with what you have. Um, And guys like, um, you know, Denny Avahia, um, you know, you had a, Gosh, I'm blanking on the the draft pick from last year. Um, the one with the Taco mm. Bell commercial. I can't even remember. Johnny Davis. I don't know why I couldn't think of his name. <laughs> um, you know, he obviously struggled last year, even going – spent some time in the G League. Um, just never really got into a great groove. Um, so, continue to give him time to, to hopefully develop it and, you know, build out into an NBA player and just start from ground zero. Um because this, though how the team has been run for the past couple of seasons, they've never really made any real moves into either direction. They've been stagnated around mm-hmm. this, right on the edge of the playoffs, right at the back up part of the lottery. You either need to be in the front of the lottery, or you need to be competing for championships. Being in that middle ground does not help you out a ton. So um, I think this is probably the first domino to fall for the team. I think Porzingis should be getting moved here very, very shortly. Um, I don't know if he'll play the season for the Wizards. If he does, I imagine he's probably gone at the trade deadline at the latest. Um, and they just they just should start fresh. Yeah, they but they've been needing to do that for years, in my opinion. Like they've like you said, they've been teetering on this we're good enough to kind of make the playoffs some years or like right on the outside, but we're not gonna be in the top five pick. It's just rip the bandit off. Like I to me Teams that do that are so dumb that just want to stay in the middle. You know you're not going to contend. Like, at some point, you have to have self-awareness. You have to be real with yourself. You know you're not going to contend. You know Bradley Bill is not going to take you anywhere. You know John Wall and Bradley Bill weren't going to take you anywhere, but you're still extending these guys, giving them all this money. Just rip the Band-Aid off and go into a rebuild. Like, teams that do that to me that just want to stay in the middle, I feel like that's the worst place to be in sports. Your team isn't good enough to win. Your team isn't bad enough to to get a high pick. You're just stuck in the middle constantly. And only the good teams, only the smart teams know how to get out of that the right way. And a bad team like the Wizards, wait till it's too late to trade a guy. Wait till his value is very, very low compared to what it was before. And then trade him like a Bradley Bill. You know, you know how much you could have got for Bradley Bill a couple years ago? You remember all them jerseys? All oh, NBA right? player just yeah. two seasons oh. ago. You know how many jersey swaps there was of him in the Miami jerseys and all yeah. that? Like you could have got a you could have gotten way more for Bradley Bill if you just traded him years ago. Before you gave him a no trade clause. <laughs> bro, that is ridiculous. To me, bro, that, that part is, is crazy. Cause honestly, I forgot he even had a no trade clause. So that part is is wild to me. Like I said before, I feel like there's only like max five, five six guys. no more than like five or six yeah that should have a no trade clause bradley bill is not one of those guys yeah no disrespect to him he's a great player and he was lo- he was loyal to the wizards no disrespect to him but he should not have a no trade clause but no nah, i agree the, the wizards just have to fully go into the rebuild i agree trey Porzingis. i think kuzma's gonna walk he's gonna go somewhere mm-hmm. um fully fully just go into the rebuild yeah, and to to make sure that we are clear, I don't think either of us think Bradley Beal is a bad player by any. No, not at all. He's a very good basketball player because I think mm-hmm. some of the discourse that's come out since this trade happened is I think a lot of people are undervaluing Bradley Beal as a player. Mm-hmm. He's a phenomenal basketball player, He's one of the player. best scorers in the league. Mm-hmm. Um, I said as a second option this year behind Porzingis had one of his most efficient seasons. He looked very good. Again, obviously the injuries have kind of been a problem the last couple of years. I think he only played 50 games this year. Um, I, we're just strictly talking about a fit perspective in Phoenix right. and scrutinizing it for them as title contenders, right? Like 
if Phoenix was a bad team and you like this is what you end up compiling, this is great. Like you are going in the right direction. But 100%. you're a team with a championship window, so you have to put together a championship roster. Yeah. I just want to make sure that's clear because I feel like people have been too harsh on Bradley Beal as a player um, because uh, I'm sure people aren't tuning into as much Wizards basketball. But, mm-hmm. you know, he still is a very, very good scorer. Um, and he's going to make great contributions on the Suns roster. Um, just I don't know if that makes them championship favorites or contenders on the same level of teams like the Nuggets are right now or the Heat or the Celtics or – any of the other number of teams who are making moves are in that range right now. But do you do you think they're a uh, would you say they're a top four team in the league? So I've seen like because I feel like with this trade you're either on the I love it they're the best team in the league or you're like kind of like us a little bit skeptical and need to see what they're yeah. doing with the roster. When I think about the top teams in the league, I look at Denver, I look at Milwaukee. I look at Boston. You could maybe convince me that they're four. Um, mm-hmm. But then again, I, I that is contingent on, I think, what some of these other teams are able to do in terms of, you know, shuffling pieces around. Um, like, what does, what does Miami do? Are they able to land a, a, a star there to move Jimmy to being a second option? Right. Um, you know, what is um, team like Philly going to do in this offseason? Um, so I, they're around that mark either way. So I mm-hmm. can see that. But to me, they are still a notch below teams like the Nuggets or the Celtics or the Bucks, just in terms of how I feel like their roster is constructed um, and what that allows them to do in the playoffs. The Suns are very limited to just like, we have a three-headed monster in Durant, Beal, and Booker. Can you stop that? Yeah. And if you can, well, what do they do? They don't have any other options. They don't have a way to throw a lot of dif- different defensive coverages. Unless Frank Vogel, known for being a defensive coach, steps these guys' level of play up. And if he does, credit to him. We are both just skeptical. Like you said, we're both just on the fence about it. But you brought up Kuzma, and that's a, a great segue into getting into some of the free agent talk that's come out since we last reported. Um, he's one of the bigger name guys who has now declined his option and is a, a full, um, unrestricted free agent who, coming off a, a good season, has continued to develop as a um, both as a scorer, but additionally as a, a great rebounder. I think in Washington as well. Um, just looking up his stats from the last. This last season, um, career high in points per game, 21.2, 21.2 points a night um, with seven rebounds um, and almost four assists as well um, on decent um, efficiencies as, as well, about 45% from the field um, and 33% from three. So um, I think he'll be a, a hot commodity in the free agent market. We know that he's capable of being a contributor on a championship level. Um, obviously being there for that that championship with Los Angeles um, in the bubble. So I think he'll be a, a hot name on the market, you know, this upcoming free agency just with, you know, his length, his skill set, his ability to shoot, um, and his ability to crash a glass as a rebounder as well. So um, interested if you have any teams in mind for, for Kuzma, any fits that you think make a ton of sense. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at the teams, I'm just trying to think, what would be a place I would like to see him at? Like I said, he he obviously can't contribute to a championship winning team. Like he was on the Lakers when they won in the bubble, so it's, he can contribute. And I think he's an even better player than he was in twenty twenty. So teams that jump out at me, I think Sacramento could be interesting. I think that's mm. a team that could use him. I'm trying to be realistic. Teams that yeah. actually have the cast space, because obviously if you, with all the all these players, you could be like Milwaukee or Boston, or whatever, but they don't really have the 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 space to bring him in. So. To me, a team that jumps out is Sacramento. I feel like they could use another person who, like you said, can can score, can rebound, can play a little bit of defense, another wing out there on the perimeter. So I, I think Sacramento to me is a little bit interesting. Um, I don't want it to stop the development of a guy like Keegan Murray, though, some of their young players. So mm-hmm. I don't want that to get in the way. But they're a team who I feel like is a piece or two away from 
they're they're already a good team. They were a good team last year, but I don't think no one really sees them as a title contending team. Like they're going to be a team that's going to be great in the regular season, can win multiple playoffs. I think they can win multiple playoff series. They get a couple more bounces. Who knows? They could have been in the second round or even further. So I feel mm-hmm. like they have a couple more pieces. They can go a little bit further. So I think Sacramento was the first team that kind of jumped out to me. Yeah, I like that one a lot. I think that makes a, a ton of sense for their fit um, and what they're they're looking to build out there in Sacramento. Another team that I've seen mentioned um, and just some rumors that I've heard is the Pacers as well. Um, okay. And I kind of like that fit a lot. They don't really have anyone at that four spot. Um, I know they made a trade for, um, you know, Jalen Jalen Smith, Jalen Johnson. I'm keeping their names mixed up. Um, yeah, Jalen Smith um, that hasn't panned out, I think, is what they thought he was kind of going to be able to bring to the table there. Um, so that four spot is pretty much still open for, for Indiana. I think that he would be a great fit to play alongside with, um, you know, Miles Turner as well as Tyrese Halliburton. Um, mm-hmm. Just continue to build out their young core there in Indiana. Um, so I, I like that as a potential fit too. I think he would bring a lot of nice things to the table. Like I said, with the spacing, his ability to shoot, um, lot tons of shooting on the court, um, right. which additionally opens up great driving lanes for guys like Benedict Matherin to to really get aggressive and go downhill. And then you know, Halley just being able to be that offensive engine for them and playmake and facilitate there. Um, I would like that fit a lot. So I think Indiana could be another team to look out here for um, for Kuzma specifically. Yeah, um, I like that. I definitely going, like that. Going into another player who has declined his player option, this one was also expected, um, is Draymond Green, who declined his player option. Now, the I think the overwhelming thought is that he's going to re-sign with Golden State. It's just a matter of making sure he gets a long-term contract in place. Mm-hmm. Um, but anytime you become an unrestricted free agent, you got to ask the question, and I saw that they were talking about it on first take earlier, too. Um, A, can the Warriors continue to compete for championships if they were not to re-sign Draymond Green? Uh, I mean, it's tough. Like, people try to discredit Draymond a lot. He does a lot for this Warriors team. Like, he does all of the dirty work. He plays – he's the, the heart of the defense – he facilitates the offense. Like, he does a lot for this team. Like, if, if Draymond wasn't to come back, their defense, I feel like, would plummet. I feel like their defense would be go down the drain if, if Draymond wasn't on this team. So, can they compete without Draymond? I don't know, man. I really don't. I don't I don't think so, especially the way that we talked about Denver. As much as we try – we didn't really talk bad about the Suns like that. We obviously didn't recognize they're still a talented team. I think they're – right now, even if they don't make any moves, I think they're a better team than the Warriors. I think they're better than the Warriors right now. So with Phoenix, with Denver, with the Lakers, a young up-and-coming Sacramento who already took them seven games, mm, I don't know. I, I don't think they can really compete if they don't have Draymond because, like I said, I feel like their defense would just go down the drain. And I feel like if they lose Draymond, like if he walks and they lose him for nothing, they don't really have the cap space to replace him with anybody. So if you let Draymond go, it's like you're just banking on these young players stepping up and stepping up huge. Now, not just taking a step to where they can contribute a little bit. Like you need them to play quality minutes and be key, key players in a championship level team. And I don't, I don't see them taking that leap, especially if we already talked about they weren't developed enough to even get minutes in a, a postseason series. Like I, I don't see them them taking that that leap that they would need. So mm-hmm. I don't I don't see them contending if they lose Draymond for nothing. Yeah, and for what it's worth, right? New GM there, uh, Mike Dunleavy. So congrats to him. Takes over for Bob Myers. Um, he's been vocal in you know, the last couple of days saying that they would like to keep Draymond. Um, so they're going to do their best to figure out you know what makes the most sense for them as an organization. But obviously. They have the ability to, even if they don't win another championship, like have the having these three guys play their entire careers with the Warriors is worth it, I think, to them as an organization for their fan base mm-hmm. to keep them there so that that is their legacy. Like they were able to bring four championships to a team um, and all played their entire careers there, which I think I'd imagine is something that 
all three of them would want. Mm -hmm. But it then comes down to how much money are you willing to sacrifice for that? Right. Because Steph, he's going to get, he's always going to be priority number one. He's always going to get his bag and he has the ability to probably get one more good contract. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, how much are you able to give Clay? How much are you able to give Draymond? How does that keep you all in title contention moving forward? Um, there are reports that Kuminga is on the trade block. He already had to get rid of Wiseman. Obviously, Jordan Poole has been in talks. We did a whole segment on it already, but this ability to try to have these two timelines simultaneously where you've got the old guys led by you know the core of Steph, Clay, and Dre, and we've got this championship window now, but at the same time, we've got the future of the Warriors, and they're going to just develop, and it's going to be this transition, and we're never going to have to rebuild. That is shattering right now. <laughs> right. And – at the same time that the young core is falling apart, they aren't able to keep it together, they aren't able to develop the way they thought they were going to be, these guys are getting older. Clay, yeah. I think, is not disrespectful to say, does not look like the same play before the injuries, which is completely understandable going through two back-to-back, -back very catastrophic injuries, obviously the ACL and the Achilles. Um I think he's taken, you know, regressed as a defender. Obviously, the shooting has, you know, been up and down, which is always going to be a reality of a, you know, a catch and shoot shooter like him. Um, he's getting older. Steph is getting older. Draymond is getting older. Like that championship window is only going to continue to get smaller and smaller. So, um, again, as much as it makes sense to keep all of these guys here to make sure that they retire as Warriors you do have to take a look as an organization and say, we've already had to deal Wiseman, right? If we really want to have these two timelines, does bringing Draymond back, bringing him back make the most sense for us to contend now and continue to develop guys like Kuminga and Moses Moody like for the future? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so with that in mind, I want to talk about some potential teams that Draymond could go to and contribute on. The first ones I'm going to throw out there are Portland and okay. Miami. Okay. The fit with Portland, I think, makes a ton of sense to me because – a, we already know what he can do with a prolific shooter. You don't need mm -hmm. to really touch more on that. Him and right. Damian Lillard would be a very similar fit to him and Steph. Mm -hmm. um, he provide a great defensive anchor for that team. Um, I think Nurkic is probably on the way out in Portland. So they can right. bring in another center, but be confident that they have another guy who's switchable onto bigs, mm -hmm. um, switchable onto perimeter guys, and just – from a, a defensive standpoint, is going to be your your guy. Like, he's going to run that side of the floor. Um, we know what he's going to bring from an effort perspective. Obviously, championship DNA, all things that you want if you are the Portland Trailblazers and so-called building a team to win a championship around Damian Lillard now. Um, I think the fit there in Portland makes a lot of sense. Miami, not as much. I've seen it talked about on a couple of different uh, – different outlets. I know they talked about it on the Dunker Spot podcast. I get it like I do, but <laughs> it feels like the the opposite of what the Suns are doing, right? Like the right. Suns already had a great <laughs> offense. Yeah. And you just say, well, let's just go all in and we add Bradley Beal. Mm -hmm. Miami held Denver well below their typical offensive output in the finals. Their offense just was limited but let's just say well shoot <laughs> we had jimmy and bam what if we just add draymond right Maybe they really just, just gonna be on lock we like, don't we gotta score play we just gotta right. stop people from scoring. <laughs> you heard jimmy they said they don't gotta score 100 points to win they're just gonna stop you but listen if draymond goes to miami they're gonna win games and the scores are gonna be like it was in the 70s and 80s like, <laughs> they, they're gonna win games 74 to 70 like they're just gonna play defense but 
No, I like the I like the Portland fit a lot because I like like you said like it's basically like playing with another not he's not obviously not as good as Steph but that's the closest thing in the league that you're gonna get to Steph as far as yeah. play styles as far as talent level so I, I I love that fit a lot I just think they would also need to bring in obviously if they're gonna contend they would need to bring in someone else another scoring option I feel like they would then I feel like they would be in that position to move off of the number three pick and bring in another like all-star to all-NBA caliber player. I don't know who that would be for them, but I feel like they would be in a position to do that because now they would have an actual quality roster around them. And I think a, a pretty good one that can that can make some noise in the West. So I like that Portland fit a lot. And the Miami one, like you said, they just <laughs> – that zone is going to be – oh, my God. Who's scoring? They're going to switch everything. Everything is going to switch. <laughs> <laughs> everything is going to switch. It is going to be hell trying to score on that Miami defense, but – like you said, that's not really what they need. I they need another scoring option there in Miami. Like defense wasn't the problem. Um, leadership, hustle, and it, all that wasn't the problem either. Like all the stuff Draymond brings, that heat culture, they it comes with it. <laughs> it comes with that. So I feel like that is isn't really what they need. But I can I can see it. You know what I mean? I could see it working. It's just the offense would just be a little bit tough. It would still you would still have all that pressure on Jimmy to score. You would have pressure on Tyler Hero to score. So. It it would be the same defense would be better, but I, I, I like I like those two fits. Portland definitely a lot more than Miami, but I like those two fits. But it's funny because you know where Draymond wants to go. He wants to go play with Big Bro in L.A. That's what he wants. To oh. go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want I don't want it. I don't want that to happen. But I just I think it's funny how everyone just because he's so close to LeBron, everyone that's the first thing they think when they think of oh Draymond's leaving. He's gonna go team up with LeBron. Like I don't see that happening. If I'm being completely honest. Yeah, and I don't. I don't think it's needed. It's like, not. I don't know. I don't. Where like do that. you like Vanderbilt becomes like almost unplayable? Literally, but I like, I I would like I like Vanderbilt in that spot more because he could guard in the perimeter. I think Draymond is a good defender. I'm not having Draymond. Vanderbilt is a better perimeter defender. That's not a knock on yeah, Draymond. Yeah, just, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't. We. I don't think the Draymond fit over there would would make sense really i don't even want anthony davis playing the five anymore i want him to play the four so you don't have to bang with those big guys down there and keep getting hurt or getting worn down i don't i don't want him doing that so i just think it's hilarious because anytime he takes a picture with lebron or he's doing something it's just <laughs> <laughs> he's like oh yeah I, he they want to go team up draymond wants to come team up but i think that's hilarious but i i like you said i really like that portland fit a lot if he was to leave the warriors yeah all, all the clutch sports guys they always it's yeah. always some they think it's colluding going on every time they get together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so I'm interested to see how that plays out in Golden State. Um I think they'll probably get it done. Um just makes a lot of sense. I know I noted it before on the pod, but obviously being from, you know, Saginaw, Michigan, Saginaw, Michigan, um, you know, I think I'm pretty sure he grew up a Pistons fan. He's talked about on podcasts before. Um he would think it would be cool to be able to play for the Pistons. Um, again, mm -hmm. obviously it's going away from title contention. And yeah, it, I think it'd be a, a great fit for that roster. Mm -hmm. um, and it'd be a good vet for those guys to continue to develop. Um, you know, playing him and, and Jalen Duran together would be great. Um, and obviously Kay Cunningham and Jay and Ivy. And then you bring in, you know, maybe a guy like Cam Whitmore in the draft and, you know, a very nice young team that can start to really, you know, take that next step and like, you know, maybe build an, out in a way that like a team like the Thunder has, you know, you were kind of in this lottery space for so long. Okay, well, now let's, let's take the next step. Let's compete. Let's try to get into the play and let's try to make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, so bringing in a guy like that, I think, you know, that makes a, a lot of sense, but it, it, you can get more money, right? Like if that's what you're yeah. going after, the Pistons can get you more. I'd imagine than what the Warriors are going to be able to give you just in terms of flexibility and, you know, future outlook um, with, like I said, that championship window, like they're going to want to maximize that now in Golden State. And the most flexibility they have is trying to shrink y'all's contract down um, so that they do have the ability to build out rosters to be competitive. So um, interested to see how that plays out there. Aside from the, free agent specific news as is always the case with draft week tons and tons and tons of trade rumors are swirling all over the place i feel like i cannot keep mm -hmm. up with them i love it um, i love this time i love this time yeah 
And so much of it is smoke. I, you yeah. just know so much of it yeah. is smoke. <laughs> um, I'm going to touch on some of the ones that I think are more realistic. It still might be smoke, but I think at least makes a little bit more sense. Some of them I think are way, it's just like people are stirring the pot, right? You're just mm-hmm. trying to see what's going to happen. One of the ones that's been intriguing me for a while um, and this obviously has been coming out really since the end of the off season or the end of the, the regular season um, is that the bulls are potentially looking to trade away Zach Levine. Um, and so they've been um, as late as, as a few days ago, continuing to contact teams, just trying to see what that market is um, mm-hmm. for a guy like Zach Levine. Um, and I think that's, that's interesting. I think obviously if, if they move off of Zach Levine, that's another look, blow it up type of situation there in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think Zach Levine could be a very, very interesting name to watch out for. Not even just, you know, past the draft, but like going into this season um, and even through into the trade deadline. Cause I think I would hope the bulls are, have realized that, you know, where they currently sit right now, some of it is completely out of their control. Like obviously the Lonzo ball stuff is. Unfortunate. Um, yeah. Really unfortunate. You hate to see that, but you know, where it currently stands with his health and his current roster, they're not a real contender in the East. They're definitely mm-hmm. not a title contender. Um, and they don't really have a lot of ways, I think, to just, you know, plug and play guys to make it work. Um, so getting off of Zach Levine to me, if you moved off a guy like Vucevic or even DeMar to an extent, um, you could still try to put some pieces together and make it work. But if you get off of Zach, that to me is like a, you're waving a white flag on this regime and like, we're going to start yeah. fresh. So, um, are you interested in any teams in particular for Zach Levine and potentially where he's going to go? Like most any star that ends up on the trade market, the Lakers are always one of the first teams that that pops up there. Um, so what would you think about like take all whatever the trade, like let's forget about all that, but like just you can wave a wand and Zach Levine is on the Lakers. Like, how do you feel about that fit? Oh, if he's on the Lakers, I love it. If I I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd love it. That gives me another scoring option. It takes pressure off of LeBron, takes pressure off Anthony Davis. Like, in a perfect world, I would love to have a third guy who would be kind of the second scoring guy, if that makes sense. Like, Anthony Davis wouldn't have this pressure to go out there and score 30 every night. Mm-hmm. His his identity would be rebound for us, play elite-level defense, and some nights you can give us 25 to 30. That could be a plus because we could have LeBron, a healthy LeBron out there he can go off with – like, we see in the regular season when he was fully healthy, would not bother by that foot. He was averaging 30 points a game. We would have Zach Levine, who is inconsistent with his scoring, I will admit that. But when you're going to be that – you're not going to get all the focus because you're going to be playing with LeBron, you're going to be playing with Anthony Davis. So that leaves opportunities for you. That would – to me, that's beautiful. Like, that's perfect in a perfect world. It's not going to happen. There's a 0% chance I feel like that happens. But I would love that in a perfect world. But – um, the Lakers, I love I love that fit. I feel like we're going to talk about them. With all of these offensive scoring guys on the move, I feel like Miami is always going to be a name that's going to be out there because yep. that's just what they need. Like, they have – we've seen – they've been to two finals in the past four years. They just need another guy. They need another scoring punch. So, I feel like Miami would be a good fit for them mm-hmm. or for, for Zach Levine. Yeah, like like I said, that, that, name, that team name is going to be out there for all of these scoring guys that's potentially on the move. I like that fit in Miami a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we've touched on it, but like if you could bring in somebody that takes the scoring load off of Jimmy, that's what you if, – if I'm Pat Riley, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I think mm-hmm. Miami has young pieces, a little bit of draft capital um, to get that done, even if that means, you know, throwing in Tyler Hero. Look, you've made the finals two out of the last, whatever, three or four years. Make, a, make that move. Right. Right. That's something that you you can live with because y'all you're right there. You're right there. You just yeah. fought through the East from the hardest seed possible. Um so 
I think that that makes a ton of sense from a fit perspective. Um, put bring Zach in, let him be the number one option there in Miami. You let Jimmy continue to lock in on the defensive end. Bam is going to be Bam and continue to you know potentially ride this flow that he had in the the postseason, the offensive side of the ball, and bring that more consistently in the regular season. And mm-hmm. this Miami team that we talk, talk about moving the needle a lot today. That moves the needle a lot for me if he's able to go there. Another fit that I think would be interesting would be a team like the Knicks. If they were able to that. go out. And that yeah. makes a lot of sense to me from both sides, even if that means including a guy like, you know, RJ in the trade. Like, that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Then you compare a backcourt of Jalen Brunson and Zach Levine. You still got a lot of young guys there. Um, Josh Hart, Manuel Quickly, um, you know, Miles McBride, Quint Grimes. Um, you do whatever you, you can figure out with, you know, Julius Randle. Um, I've heard that Obi Toppin potentially might be on the market too, which I think is a mistake. I think that in the minutes that he was able to play, he had tons of flashes. At this point, yeah, I would get back whatever I can for Julius Randle, your all NBA player. And I like, was just about to say that. Yeah, Obi mm-hmm. Toppin going. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if you move Obi, whatever, like, I think that that, you know, backcourt of Jalen Brunson and Zach Levine is very, very intriguing. Um, two bucket getters, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I think the Knicks are also be an interesting fit there. Um, and I think that that would continue to put New York in a position to really be a serious threat out east. Um, so I'm, I'd be interested to see how all of this plays out in Chicago. I know we touched on it after, you know, playing tournament, but. They got a lot, a lot of moves to make this offseason. And if Zach Levine is the first one, then the biggest domino falls first. And it feels like we should see a, a lot of selling immediately after that. 100%. I, listen, I, need one, I need one of these. I don't even want these guys to team up with Mikael Jordan over there in Brooklyn, too. Like, I've, been seeing, I've been seeing that team, too. I need somebody to team up with Mikael Jordan, man. If he take that leap, he just get another person with him. I don't know. I don't, I don't think they could be one of those top teams in the East, but they could. They They're gonna be a fun team, no matter what. They could keep, they could run it back for the roster they got right now. I don't have to Told add you. anybody. That's gonna be a fun team. Told you, that's one of my teams, bro. Brooklyn, OKC, them young teams. But I need to listen. They they gonna be real fun to watch. Real real fun to watch. But I like I like that Knicks fit too. I was thinking that too. I was looking at the Knicks and I was thinking how is that pairing gonna work. I'm not opposed to moving off of Julius Randle for that either. Like Julius Randle to me, I'm not a huge fan. Like I feel like he's kind of a ball stopper. He's not he's not great in the playoffs. He's not sometimes he's not even good in the playoffs. Like he's just borderline a bad player when it comes to playoff time. So I'm not opposed to moving off of him because like you said, I like the minutes that Obi Toppin gets. When he when he's in there, I feel like he plays very, very well. So I'm not opposed to moving off of him for that. Right. And if you're bringing in a guy like Zach Levine, the scoring, like you're bringing in additional scoring output. So mm-hmm. if you do move off of Julius Randle and then you're just bringing back you know, quality players from that point, um, and just building out that way. I think that makes sense. You're still going to have a guy like Emmanuel quickly coming off the bench, six right. man of the year candidate. Um, you go, and like we've all been saying, get a little bit of less top heavy, but build out a more, you know, cohesive roster. I like that a lot for them. Another name that this is probably the most recent trade rumor. I saw this one last night. The Clippers are now gauging the trade interest in PG-13, Paul George himself. Mark you don't Stein, say. <laughs> Mark okay. Stein is reporting that league sources tell him that the Clippers have left various rival teams with the impression through their draft week conversations that they are, at a minimum, attempting to gauge Paul George's trade value and to hear some describe it giving real consideration to disassembling the Kawhi Leonard, Paul George tandem. Oh, okay. We're disassembling it. So it sounds like it was a failure. That's what you're telling me. (laughs) It sounds like it didn't work. That's what I'm hearing. And listen, from a Lakers fan, I've heard the most ridiculous, like I've heard the most ridiculous things when it comes to comparing the LeBron AD tenure with the Lakers and the Kawhi Paul George tenure with the Lakers. I've heard Anthony Davis cannot play. I heard he's a street. They call him street clothes. Day to Davis. Street clothes. Day to Davis. Anthony Day to Davis. Meanwhile, Kawhi's not playing. Paul George is 
podcast, and he's like us out here. <laughs> Granted, great podcast, by the way. Like, Paul Jones' podcast is, is one of the best player podcasts. He, yeah, I'll give him some credit. That podcast is very, very good. I'll yeah. give him that. He might have to do that full time because he can't play basketball. <laughs> he's not going to be on the court. So he might have to be a podcaster full time. But listen, I've heard that the Lakers. LeBron years have been a fi- I've heard failure and I've heard that all, all the Clippers gotta do is get healthy when they're healthy they're a top team in the West I've heard all they gotta do is get healthy old time the Lakers won a championship and the Clippers cannot have their two guys healthy and when they did they blew a 3-1 lead that's all I'm gonna say that's all I'm saying but uh, yeah Lakers fan aside I'm just looking at this from what the Clippers should do it has been a failure. The Kawhi Paul George experiment has not worked out. They at this point, certain teams when they're injured or when they their stars get injured, it is more like a dang, well, like that's just bad luck. Like for the Clippers, mm-hmm. it is a certainty. They will get injured. Like one of the two will break down. And it's it's a lot of times it's not even like a little nagging injury that you can play through. Like Kawhi, he'll be he'll drop 35 points and then you'll just get a report the next day he just tore his ACL. Like, what? Like, not no, you won't even see it happen. Yeah. You'll just get a report like, yeah, Kawhi just tore his ACL or something crazy like that, like mm-hmm. spraying this something, something. So Kawhi's knees can't hold up. Paul George seems like he's always going to break down. So it has not been a success. And unfortunately for them, they've had great, great rosters. They've had title-winning type of rosters. Like, they've had – quality role players great depth they've had one of the best one of the best coaches in the league so it is unfortunate for them but it has been a failure like at at some point you have to look at breaking up these two because they just can't stay healthy yeah and it's it's oh it's a failure solely because when you put that type of talent together you like you're trying to contend for titles and that just did not happen. Didn't make the mm-hmm. finals. Talent was there. I think I would say both of us probably could agree. If they were able to stay healthy, they would have made it out of the West one of these years. One of they had. It was only a matter if they were healthy every single year. Yeah, it was like they were gonna. They have might have time. a championship by now. Like they, even this know, they season, might. even this season, I was like going into the playoffs. I'm like if they can just get PG back. This is a mm-hmm. scary Clippers team. Yeah, it's just gonna get Paul George back. They, I feel like they could have beat the Suns if Kawhi never got hurt. Let alone I, I Paul agree. George. And then if Paul George comes back, Nugget series. Who knows? Who knows? Right? Who knows? Because if you're gonna talk about a team constructed to disrupt the two man game the way oh Miami was able to, yeah, you have two great perimeter defenders, mm-hmm. bodies, big bodies to be able to rotate through, like. They have options there. So I, I think had they been able to stay healthy, um, they would have been able to make some noise. But again, like you said, it has to get viewed as a failure because, you know, whether it was – it's no one's fault, really. It's just unfortunate. But, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes that's just the way that the cookie crumbles, you know. But yeah. um, part of this seems like it probably has a lot to do with the CBA. The Clippers had the biggest payroll – um, in the NBA last season, um, and again are going to be, I think, probably top three or top five in terms of, of salary cap, which means they're going to be over that second tax apron for the second year in a row. Um, we touched on how the new CBA, you know, if you're above that, you know, second tax level, um, the the penalties that you face are significantly more harsh than they were previously. Limits you from being able to even utilize the mid level exception. Um, it really hinders your ability to. Um, you know, construct out a roster and be super top heavy with, you know, lots of big contracts on the books. Um, So that I feel like ties into it in addition to obviously just the fact that they haven't been able to stay healthy between the two of them. Um, And to your point, like you said, you think that this Clippers team might have beaten the Suns if they could have just had Kawhi. Mm Mm-hmm. And so maybe they're reaching the point where it's like, look, maybe we can get, you know, a couple other guys in here. And if we just have Kawhi, that might just be enough. We saw what he did in Toronto, granted. Yeah. 
injuries in that final series to Kevin Durant helped that out and, and Clay Thompson as well. But at the end of the day, two-time finals MVP was able to go one year in Toronto and got the job done because he stayed healthy the whole time. If he's able to do that again, who knows? Um, that might be something that the Clippers are willing to bet on here. Um, so I'm interested to see how this plays out. I think it's probably the right move to break this duo up. I think that it has run its course. Just when you have this many times in a row where the two of them are getting hurt. And even I think one of the times that they were healthy, they got beat by Luca in the bubble. Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it feels like it's, it's time. Like you've given it multiple, multiple opportunities. You built out the roster around them various different ways. It just, it didn't work out. Hey man, uh, they, they beat the Lakers 11 straight times though. So they're happy. They're good. That, that's their championship. <laughs> I need That's really a crazy stat though. That is like ridiculous. I'm not, listen, I, listen, I can be honest. They be they kill us every time they play. Us. Like, <laughs> we can't beat them guys, but it's never gonna matter because they're never gonna be healthy. So it, it literally does not matter. But it like I was looking at something though. If if they're serious about wanting to build a team around Damian Lillard, I think a Paul George trade is very very mm -hmm. very interesting. Like I agree. I mean. Apparently they're talking about moving off the number three overall pick. If they, I, I, I still, I think we're both in agreement that I would just move Dame and just yeah. go in the direction of drafting Scoot and going from there. But if they really want to contend, I think a Paul George trade is very, very interesting. It gives Demi a little bit of second guy. If they can somehow find a way, like you said, to get a Paul George, and then if Draymond really isn't going to come back to Warriors, add a guy like Draymond. I think that that team. I'm intrigued. Really, I'm very, very, very intrigued. I would love that team a lot. Yeah. And you have Damian Lillard, Paul George, Draymond Green. I think that that that's a uh, that I don't that doesn't put them past the uh, Nuggets. Obviously, at this point, I'm not even going to start. I'm not even going to talk about the Nuggets. I feel like they're just in a class by themselves. They they are entering a, a contention conversation. Like that is a legitimate Western Conference threat. That's right. all that matters. Just get mm -hmm. to that point because y'all right. are not there right now. Yeah, I, I like that team a lot. I, I'm going to keep saying it because that's what they need. Miami, that's a great team. That's a great yeah. – I feel like that's a great fit. You're not losing defense either. Paul George is still going to give you defense, but he doesn't even have to be the best defender on the team. He doesn't have to guard the best uh, the best perimeter friend, the best perimeter player on the other team and still give you a lot of elite-level scoring. So I think Orland, that'd be nice. Miami – That'd be nice. I think I love those two. Those two fits the most, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so interested to see how that's all going to play out. Um, but PG thirteen might be on the move. <sighs> interesting, interesting, interesting stuff, man. This is like you said. It's one of the most exciting times because it's just so many rumors yeah, swirling man. around all the time. Um, Somebody that's been in rumors probably every single year since he's been with Atlanta, John Collins, <laughs> reportedly on the trade block for the 50th time. <laughs> yeah, he was supposed to get traded. I've seen him in so many jersey swaps. He's supposed to get traded. I don't know. Every single offseason, he's supposed to be getting traded. So mm -hmm. at that point, I don't know if it's smoke. I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know either, but Woj is reporting that the Hawks are potentially looking to, to package John Collins, um, DeAndre Hunter, or even DeJounte Murray with the number 15 overall pick to look to move up in the draft, which is interesting to me why you want to go higher. Um, or Who are they targeting? DeJounte. Man, I don't know. Um, but interesting to me that you would want to move higher and get young um, with – kind of what you have going there now, but or even interesting that you want to trade DeJounte because I still think that that fit can work. I, mm -hmm. Like, I know a lot of people are against it. I feel like I'm one of the select few that still is like, I'm a believer that the two of them can play together. 
because of how much attention Trey can command off the ball. It's just a matter of him getting more comfortable of not having to be the high usage offensive engine that he's been for his entire time in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, and the moments that the both of them played well last year, the team looked good. Um, you saw what they did in the playing game against, you know, Miami, who ended up going to the finals. We saw what they were able to do against Boston. Um, so I'm, uh, I don't really understand why they want to move off DeJounte this early. It feels like an overreaction. Um, again, with a brand new coach who took over late in the season, like let, at least let that play out first. Let that see what, right. let's see what it looks like come the beginning of this season. And then if you want to make something at the trade deadline, then okay. But, um, I feel like this is a little bit too early, but like I said, John Collins has been on the trade block forever. They need to just get that done because it's not even it's not fair to him. Yeah. <laughs> Every single year he's in in trade discussion. So um, they need to figure that out. I've seen him linked to teams like Portland as well. Um, so. Yeah, I, I don't understand why they would want to move off of DeJounte Murray, but yeah, like we said, a lot of this could just be smoke and mirrors to you know, try to sway people in different directions. That must suck being an NBA player, and you're in like imagine seeing your name in trade rumors every single off season. Like, I I can see why guys get frustrated. Like when Jalen Brown was constantly his name was constantly get thrown into every time KD was a little bit flustered. I've seen like Jalen Brown rumors. Let's trade Jalen Brown like that. Mm-hmm. That must really suck. Like to be an NBA player, and your name is constantly get brought up. So I can see why that could be a, a very very frustrating as an NBA player. Oh, hundred percent, and especially because. You see guys, you know, talk about – you talk with the front office, like, about these rumors, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. And then, like, you do get the call, like, hey, you're on the move, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> that's, that's, like, bad business, right? Like, you yeah. just be open and honest about it. So, as much as probably the vast majority of it is smoke and mirrors, like, you can't deny it. There have been times where they were told that it wasn't – going to be like this and then they end up getting moved last second mm-hmm. and you just have to chalk it up to that's how business works you know yeah so definitely gotta be tough as a, a player especially a guy like john collins particularly who is or jalen brown right like they're in trade talks all the time constantly mm-hmm. uh, like you never can get settled anywhere. Like you're gonna go Ever. You're never buy safe. a home. You might have a family, got kids, get them in the schools, and then it's like boom, you're on the other side of the country. And you Literally. gotta be there in two days. A day. Sometimes they gotta be there and like you gotta pack right now and you gotta leave up and leave. Like you gotta yeah. leave everything. That, that's it's crazy. I mean, they make millions, but that's a it's a it's a rough way to live, to be honest. But no, I think definitely it, this is an interesting off season though, because somebody's moving somewhere some big big ish name is moving somewhere like yeah it's some some team is gonna get their guy that's gonna help them in that title contending uh position it's gonna be very, very interesting who knows the way the sun's owner moving he might trade deandre ayton for paul george at this point they might just quadruple down on the scoring you never know <laughs> um do you think there's gonna be a lot of trades on draft night in a weird way, yeah. I don't know. I just got a, like a weird feeling that something is, something's gonna move. I think there's gonna be some sort of trade that's gonna be like, oh shoot, like that. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Like I feel like there's gonna be some move somewhere. There's just been too much talk of Portland moving off the third pick. All right. Pelicans want to move up. Like something. I feel like something's gonna happen. I've seen Zion in trade rumors. I've seen. I've seen say- Zion to Charlotte rumors for that number two pick. Exactly, because they – yeah, I've seen that. The Pelicans want to move up. Sion and LaMelo on the same team. The lobs. You, I'll have to block Bleacher Report. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yo, bro, they would be in every single post, every single every single highlight is just going to be LaMelo to Zion, LaMelo, Zion. It's, but it would be very, very fun to watch. Very, very fun to watch. You've seen all the, the, the crazy highlights that they, that Melo has with um with Miles Bridges. You've seen that. And imagine that with Zion. Oh, my God. That'd be crazy. And if, if Zion could actually stay healthy, man, that team – listen, that team is not terrible. They won, what, like 40-something games two years ago. Mm-hmm. And they had, like, an injury-riddled season this year. But, listen, that's, that wouldn't be bad. I still feel like 
Zion, like we talked about, they're going to be good on the Pelicans if he's healthy. Like, they're a good team as it is. Just yeah. The, he's got to play. Exactly. It's the injury stuff. I've heard it's the off-the-court stuff. That stuff aside, that's a whole that's a whole nother that's a whole nother problem. <laughs> but I, I don't feel like that should weigh into anything basketball. That's yeah. what a man does with his off off the court <laughs> in that instance, that's his business. I don't think that should have nothing to do with on the court. It's just yeah. funny though. Yeah, I feel like it's either gonna go one of two ways. Either we're gonna get a couple of big trades on draft night or a lot of small trades going on, like, mm-hmm. or nothing. Like, it's everybody's just going to keep their picks. Yeah. So, I feel like it's got to be one of the two. I, as a fan, right, I feel like everybody's hoping for the shakeup, right? Everybody wants to see. Yeah. Let's trade. see something happen. Right, I want to, I, I might delete Twitter for the night so I can see Adam Silver walk to the podium and talk about the Blazers are trading the third overall yeah. right. Like That'd I want to see it live. Just like side note, Wolves and Shams have really ruined like watching the draft, honestly. Because you get Bro. the notification instant, like the, the clock is still going down on the TV, and it's like so and so is selecting this or oh trade already happened. It's like, not you're ruining it for me. I don't want to see that. Like honestly, yeah, I need to put my phone on D and just not look at, at Twitter. And it's annoying because you want to look at Twitter because you want to see the reactions of the pick. I don't want right. to see the pick. That stuff is that's, it's annoying because I just want to yeah. see it live and want to experience it. It yeah, ruins a like, lot of stuff. You think back in the day to some of the bigger draft day trades, like you just waited for David Stern to come to the table yeah. and announce it. And it was like you hear the reaction through the crowd like, oh, shoot, like mm-hmm. the Hornets are trading Kobe to the Lakers, right? Like, right. Whoa. So that kind of stuff is like, you kind of lost that aspect of the draft in every sport. Like even the NFL draft is the same way. Like Schefter is tweeting out everything before it happens. Like it ruins a lot of picks for me. Like why do we even why do we even broadcast it? Might right, as well just have it live. Just on tweet it. it. Yeah, just <laughs> right. tweet it out. Like it, like the Jameer Gibbs pick. I seen it on my phone first, and I was like, I like I was like what? And then I had to watch it to like make sure I wasn't bugging or something. But like that's a pick I would have loved to just watch because it would just been like. They're taking him at number 12? What? Right. Like, that would have shocked me if I just watched it live. So, yeah, it, it ruins a lot of stuff just getting the tweets. Like, these guys are too good at their job. Like, they, they need to yeah. chill out a little bit. These guys are too good at their job. Bro, and Shams was on – he was on a Through the Wire pod, podcast, and I think it was Pierre was talking to him. Like, it's the same exact thing. Like, bro, I have to mute you when I watch mm-hmm. the draft because you spoil every pick. He was like, well, you could think about it like – just leave it on and sometimes I'm not always right you know like I you know I I miss every now and then it's like bro you have like a 99.9% hit percentage bro. yeah <laughs> like what <laughs> what are you talking about you're rarely wrong bro right <laughs> um that's crazy yeah so look that aside I do think that I think that we'll have a lot of trades I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have a lot of trades at least either way if Portland keeps a pick then hopefully they're trained Dame or they're going to trade the pick so we're gonna get a splash trade, another big splash trade this this off season, at least I would hope. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm excited for that. If you have any prospect, I don't know how much you kind of dove into college basketball or watching some of the, the prospects. Do you have anyone in particular that, like, obviously aside from the top guys like you know Victor Scoop, Brandon or whatever, anybody kind of later in the lottery that you are interested in? Um, or that you kind of think is flying under the radar? Unfortunately, I'm not a huge college basketball guy. So, like, I don't really – like, I'd be sitting here lying to you if I said I had, like, a sleeper pick who I think is going to be, like, really good in the NBA. So, um, unfortunately, no, I don't really I, – I, I always say I need to get more into college sports, like, football and basketball. I all Every single year when it's around that time, I'm like, wow, like, I really need to get into this, and just for some reason I just don't. So, I don't really have any pick that's, like, under the radar i'm just more interested to see what they're going to do with the like those top three picks i mean obviously one aside Mm -hmm. i do want to see where the thompson twins go because i want to see if they're actually because they play in that with that ote league yeah i do want to see if they're actually like quality players i don't know that what the competition level in that league Mm -hmm. is i see a highlight it's like they like they're playing at la fitness so like (laughs) no disrespect to the league i'm just saying like maybe they're just no i would put some disrespect to the league but it's 
watching them like their highlights like the benefit of it is is like what they're good at is translatable to every aspect of basketball like it wouldn't have mattered if they were at legitimately at of LA fitness or if they were playing for Duke or whoever, like mm-hmm. their athleticism is going to translate like quick, how fast their first step is twitchy, yeah. like all that stuff that would have showcased everywhere. And their lack of shooting also would have showcased no matter where they were at. So, yeah, I guess that's the, the benefit of it is like, you really have to like, view it through the lens of like what is translatable to the league outside mm-hmm. of um like the competition aside because i think over time the league is a little sketch um <laughs> you but, seen the uh hey, it was, i was watching it i was just scrolling on tiktok i seen the pick aside podcast they were talking about it dude mm-hmm. said one of the dudes was like yeah the ot league is, ot league is a joke they commented under he was like bro why y'all do us like that <laughs> i was like i was like dang <laughs> it's just it's like uh like they're trying to find ways to make it more entertaining to the younger generations, which is like from a business perspective, I get it totally mm-hmm. makes a ton of sense. But it just is like is this really the best way to go about you know evaluating talent, or whatever. And so like if the Thompson twins pan out to be good, obviously it's only gonna be great for them. Um, because more people will view it as a, a serious way to be able to showcase their talents as an alternative to you know t- the college route or even now the G League route or overseas. Mm-hmm. So, like, having more options, I think, is always going to be good. But I have qualms with the league about the style of play. Like you said, at times it just looked like glorified AAU. That's what it looks like to me. It's just a yeah. – it looks like an AAU – like, I'm watching an AAU tournament. So, I – for the longest, I didn't even know, like, that was, like – I just thought that was something people did in, like, their – off season time, like I didn't know that that was that was the league they play in to get into the NBA. Like I didn't yeah. know that for the longest time. So yeah, yeah it's, it's I feel, they got a lot riding on these two twins then because like if they come out and they're bust, that league could just go down the drain. Like people are gonna <laughs> people are never. I, I'm just be honest. No one's gonna take that serious if those yeah. guys are come on their bus. No one's gonna take that league seriously. Yeah, I I think that they both should. Hopefully, pan. Like I said, I think just athletically, the both of them are like they are on another level. Mm-hmm. Um, both of them obviously struggle shooting the ball, but for their benefit, shooting is something that you can teach and something that you can get better at That's true. Um, in the NBA. So you can't teach forty plus inch vertical or yeah. quick first step. That's got to be genetically gifted. So um, I'm interested to in how that'll pan out. Um, like I, I think I was more – I spent more time watching college basketball and getting into the prospects last year. Didn't have as much time this year to get into it. Um, obviously, with the draft coming around the corner, I've done a little bit more research. Um, but one guy that I do like a lot that I've seen really be all over the place in mock drafts, I've seen him go, like, as low as, like, late 20s, end of the first round. And I've seen some people have him – Top six, top eight is Leonard Miller with the G League Ignite team. Um, this past season averaged a double double, 18 and 11 with uh, 1.6 assists um, and a steal and a block a game. Um, good total shooting 55% from the field. Um, three point percentage was okay, 32%. Um, obviously, again, like we just said, that's something that you can teach and get better at. But to me, he has everything you would want in a modern day wing player. 6'10, 210 pounds, can handle the ball well, can self create for himself to an extent. Um, lengthy defender. He's scrappy. Um, I, I went and watched him play in person against the, the Austin Spurs, who, again, the benefit of playing with the G League team is like you're playing other pro basketball players, you're playing other grown men. Um, mm. It just, his ability to just fight and scrap against guys who are bigger than him. Like he has a great motor. He has a good sense and feel for the game. Um, it felt like they were trying to you know, post him up a lot in that game. I don't see that being how he would play in the, um, in the NBA, but it, like that could potentially be a, you know, an asset to his game that he does have. But um, he, if he can, you know, continue to develop as a shooter would be a great play as a three and D wing a play as a connector piece. Uh, cutter facilitator has the ability to you know take people off the dribble as well um, so Leonard Miller is a name that I think 
as you get later and later into the lottery, a team should take a I don't even want to say take a chance on him because I think he is at that, you know, talent level to be a lottery draft pick easily. Um, I think he has the talent to be a top 10 guy in this year's draft. But like I said, I think I've seen – he's one of the players I've seen the most fluctuation on um, in terms of people mocks, people's mock draft boards, um, having him all over the place in the first round. So that's somebody that I, I looked at that I think is getting underrated on the whole. Um, and if he does get picked relatively high in the lottery, there will probably be some level of surprise. But I think it's, it's warranted just with what I've seen from him. Um, and how his skill set specifically with his size would translate immediately. He could be an effective contributor on an NBA team. What team would you want to see him on the most? Um, let me pull up the draft order because like I say he's not going to go in front of any of the, the bigger name guys. Um, but once we get into like Indiana, I think would be a nice fit for him. I know we're just talking about trying to fill that four spot. I'd like to see him with a team like the Pacers. Um, even a team like Dallas, potentially, if they end up keeping their pick. Um, Oklahoma City, if they just want to, like, again, 6'10", fits the bill, tall, like mm -hmm. you got they're building out young core there. Yeah, I mean, 6'10". Right. <laughs> same thing with the Raptors, right? Like, you know they like their tall players in, in Toronto. So, <laughs> right. Um, I think that those are all, you know, nice fits for him. If he falls out to the lottery, first team outside of the lottery is Atlanta. I think that that could make a ton of sense too, especially if they look to move off of John Collins, right? Seems like that could be an easy plug and play with another young guy like Jalen Johnson. You're trying to build out a real nice young core there who in a couple of years can really help contribute with Trey Young. Um, you might have something, something brewing there. So um, I like all those fits there um, for him. I think that he's just uh, – I think he's a very, very good player and fits what a lot of teams want in what NBA wings look like these days. So um, that's a name that I'm looking out for on draft night for sure. Um, yeah. I want to get your thoughts on – speaking of, of Paul George's podcast, I know we talked about it earlier. Um, Carl Anthony Towns was up there. He said some wild stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, first thing that he said, he believes that the Timberwolves, <laughs> he believes that the Timberwolves winning the playing tournament, um, and making the playoffs last year was more special than the Nuggets winning the championship this year. Well, they for sure celebrated like it. You had Patrick Beverly jumping up. Waving and waving, his, <laughs> taking his shirt off, crying tears like he just won the championship. I mean, they if you didn't know, if you watch Jokic shake everybody hand, right? If you watch Pat Bev celebrate, you if you muted the TV, you would have thought that was the NBA finals, right? Exactly, you would have thought the roles was reversed and that they the Nuggets won the playing game and the Wolves won the championship. But listen, Carl Anthony Towns says a lot of crazy stuff, bro. Like, I don't know if it's the, the water in Minnesota. Because he <laughs> says some crazy stuff. Pat Bev always says some crazy stuff. Like, they will just be bugging. Like, they say a lot of stuff in Minnesota. That's just, I don't know. I like I don't even see, how can you even explain how that's better than winning the championship? How can you explain that? His reasoning was this Denver team has been constructed and they've been building and playing together for three, four years now. You know, they were able to piece it together around the trade deadline and get it done. So they had, he's like, they had three, four years. We had three, four months. But you won a playing game. <laughs> like, bro, you didn't win the chip. Like, like, and then, and then went and like legitimately that Grizzlies Timberwolves series was like back and forth. Who's going to sell? Both literally. teams had opportunities to close out the series and they just, Horrible stretches of basketball, sloppy play. Throwing the game away. Right. Throwing all the games away. It was crazy. Like, so. what, bro, bro, what are you talking about? Like, I wouldn't even say that about the Lakers. We legitimately threw the team together and made it to Western Conference Finals. I would never say in my life, say, well, what we did was more impressive than the Nuggets winning the championship. What? Right. <laughs> like, Nothing yeah. is more impressive than that. Everybody's bro. trying to do that thing. Exactly. <laughs> Carthy tells he's bugging, bro. The crazier part is that isn't even a, the wildest thing he said, because he followed that up, 
and I got the direct quote here. When my time is up and I retire, there will be people that say I changed the game. Carl Anthony Towns. Bro, and I mean this with absolutely no disrespect. Carl Anthony Towns is a great player, one of the best centers in the league. Change the game is crazy. What have you done to change the game? I think maybe we're starting to throw that word around too much. Like actual people that change basketball that are real, like have an influence on the next generation of players. That gets reserved for guys like Allen Iverson, LeBron, Steph, Harden, Kevin Durant, like the top of the top guys, because there are direct links to how they play, to how people play, teams are constructed. Like they have a direct link to change in not even just the NBA in some cases, because you see how youth basketball has changed and Steph took over, right? Mm -hmm. You see how teams are drafting, how people are thinking about utilizing, um, you know, seven foot guys since people like Dirk or KD came into the league, right? They're not getting relegated just playing on the block and having to set screens. What if we put the ball in their hands? What happens then? Because now we see what these guys are able to do. That's what it, that's when you change the game. Being a seven foot, you know, center that can shoot threes, great. First of all, you're not the first one to do it. No, you didn't change the game in that in that front. Are you one of the best to do it? Hundred percent, great. What else have you done that's going to change the game? Listen, I need his level of delusional delusional confidence because. That's crazy. Like, people going to remember you more for that that meme where you was backing down Boogie Cousins and he was looking at you like you was a little boy. People going to remember you from that more than – They going to remember him. From, didn't Ben Simmons choke him out? <laughs> Had him in a headlock, right? <laughs> well, That's a remember. bigger memory than, like, in, in comparing that to game-changing stuff that you brought to the table. That, I think he was just helping his boy out getting some, like, some, some cool Clicks. stuff there that was – Yeah, bro, because that is a – that's wild. If you truly believe that, I respect you for that having that level of delusional confidence in yourself. Yeah. That's crazy. Because look, if we're being real, you are a byproduct of somebody like Dirk. Right. Big guys didn't have the luxury of coming in and being shooters like that at that like to that extent until mm-hmm. somebody like him came in and started doing it. Mm-hmm. He basically invented the stretch big. All right. You are the next generation of that. That's great. That's not game changing. You're a byproduct of somebody that changed the game. You're great at doing it. You may go down as one of the best, if not the best shooting big of all time, just with volume and efficiency. And again, the way that the game is trending because of guys like Steph, right? And because of all of that, you can have all of that. It can be it's all well and good. That does not mean that you change the game. Like you're not, you can't just throw that around. So <laughs> barring him, I don't know what he has. You know, he's talking about in the future when he retires. So maybe he's got something cooking. I don't know what he's about to add to his bag this off season. But I don't know. Listen, listen the only thing you're not even the number one guy on your team right now. Only thing he be changing is his voice in these interviews. <laughs> that's the, that's the only thing that be changing with Carl Anthony Towns, bro. One minute he's Batman, the next minute he's a city girl. So like, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what he's talking about. He be changing. Oh bro. my god, he really did. I'll <laughs> <laughs> oh. with Cap, but Cap's funny, bro. He is Cap's funny, a funny guy. He is, is funny. funny guy. Big Per, <laughs> the big. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Big Per gotta be the wildest NBA nickname. Right <laughs> oh, oh, gave him that name, bro, and set him up for failure, bro. That is crazy. And the fact that he's running with it is ten times even ten times funnier, bro. Yeah, no, I respect it because that's a, that's a good laugh. That's a good laugh. <laughs> but um. Man, that is yeah, funny, he's bro. He's definitely, definitely more known for changing his voice. <laughs> the game right now, because that interview was crazy. That's hilarious, bro. That is he, too. He funny. really hopped on the mic, like you know, we just gotta, we gotta <laughs> do what it is. Like we gotta, 
is what movies is made of. Right. <laughs> I was like, bro, who are you, bro? What are you talking about? Oh, man. That is funny. Shout out, Cap, bro. That is, that's funny. But, yeah, you are – I would not say you're a game changer by <laughs> – <laughs> I don't know. Can you be a game changer and not be the best player on your team? No, you can't be a game changer and not be one of the best people in the league. Like right. changing the game is like people, like you said, people are legitimately going to play the game differently even after you retire and for like years later. No one's gonna like, no, no one's gonna do anything because of Cat. People could like do stuff that he does well, but it's not gonna be like because of him. Like you said, he's not the first big to be able to shoot mm-hmm. like. Okay, you didn't really change nothing. Is Cat a top five center in the league right now? Jokic and Bead, obviously. Mm-hmm. Are we including Anthony Davis? He's a power forward, but he plays center. If we're not including him, I'll just take him out. We can keep him. Anthony Davis. We including Bam. He's not better than Bam. Bam, yeah, not better than Bam. I mean, who else? Sabonis made all. Yeah, Sabonis is a center. Sabonis. Yeah, I'd say Sabonis. Off the top of my head, trying to look at matter of fact, I got a whole list of the teams right now. Let me see. I mean, there's. Hmm. I think it's bro. I almost really think. You tell me if I'm crazy. I think it's arguments to be made that you could put Brooke Lopez in front of him. Hey man, I value defense, so I'm not mad at it. Like. I'm not mad. He's right. He can play the four. It don't help that he had to play the four this year, and that's a you know weird feeling for him to have to actually defend on the perimeter after playing the five for so long. But mm-hmm. he's Lopez he's more. Than... What you say? Lopez is a capable shooter mm-hmm. and a defensive player of the year candidate. He's more talented than Brook, obviously. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, on a championship level team, which one would you rather have? Yeah, I, I, I probably take Brook. Yeah, I would say it's a toss up there. I would say I'd say probably no. Probably no. Just off the names we said alone, if you're saying uh Jokic and Bead, A D Bam, Sabonis, nah. And I ain't even really a huge fan of Sabonis either, to be honest. But I felt he just had to me he just had like a bad a bad playoff series. He'll probably bounce back from that. Yeah, I, I I would take Sabonis over Cat too. So like yeah. like you said, I think Jokic and Embiid, um Obviously, the top, the top two there. If you're counting AD, I think I'd put AD in front of him. Mm-hmm. I would take Bam in front of him. Um, so he's in that range for sure. But, um, like, if he is top five, it's, like, right. He ain't going no higher than four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because even uh, if you take out – you could take out Bam and AD, he's still, what, fourth? Which is – bro, the center position is so weak. Like, besides those top two guys, because me personally, I don't think AD is a center. Like, he played center this year. He's not yeah. a center. Bam is 6'9". Like, he I, he has to play center for them. But he is not a center, really. He is in the small ball, like, era, kind of. Mm-hmm. But he's not a real center. So, like, the center position outside of the top two guys is kind of weak. So, like, even you being, the what, the fourth best center? Okay. Like, congrats, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. That's just something that I was – after he said all that, I really sat and thought. I was like, is he even, like, up there in terms of his own position? Um, so – He's not where yeah. he should be. Remember, they, they were projecting him, like, to be this top guy in the league for years. Like He could. Like, he has the talent to be in that same conversation with the top guys. Um, it just has not panned out as well in Minnesota. Um, I think obviously the Gobert stuff hurts him from spacing perspective. His defense took a massive hit again because you're asking a seven footer to guard wings. Yeah, That's it was a bad, it was great. a setup from the jump. Right. Um, so all that definitely hurt him. But look, going back to the main point, not a game changer. No, nah. not a game changer. No, sir. Um. We also finally got the the big hammer that uh, Adam Silver was saving for after oh, the, the NBA that. Finals was over and officially announced that John Morant is going to be on a 25-game suspension to start next season, which automatically eliminates him from all NBA contention. 
Mm-hmm. So in turn, I've seen people, you know, basically estimate him missing out on all NBA this year and from, you know, missing it out next year and just game checks, like upwards of $50 million <laughs> lost, which is an absurd amount of money to think about. It's more money than most people will ever, 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 ever come close to seeing in their lifetime. Right. Lost that in a couple of months. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's crazy. And added into that suspension is a stipulation that he basically has to almost like pass a number of checkpoints to be reinstated, um, which feels like a direct shot at the fact that he did the whole couple of days in rehab thing, but immediately going back to the exact same problem as soon as you get out of that um, makes the league feel like they need to see not just you saying that you feel like you did wrong, you know, understanding, accepting responsibility, like they need to see actual change in your actions. Um, so 25 games to me, I think people, I was, you know, just based off the way Adam Silver worded, it seemed like it was going to be like half a season. So from that standpoint, he lucked out. I think this is honestly one of the larger NBA suspensions of all time, I'm gonna pull it up now. But um, I know, I know, Arena's got something crazy. Yeah, Ron well, Artest had, you know, 86 game suspension. <clears throat> Stephen Jackson um, was in there too, right? Right. So the heftiest ones is OJ Mayo. That's drug related. Um, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me look at this now. Pull this up. No, yeah, OJ Mayo, 164 games. Ron Artest, 86. Um, Latros Biro had a 60 game suspension. Gilbert Arenas had a 50 game. And then Javaris Crittenton had a 38 game because they were the two that were going at it um, in the locker room in Washington. Um, and so I believe that makes it the sixth longest suspension in NBA history. Um, which, when you put it into context like that, that is a big suspension. And then, again, yeah. looking at what's in front of it, like drug-related stuff, the malice at the palace, the Trell Spiro to- choked out P.J. Carlissimo in practice. Um, so, it's a pretty big suspension in, you know, the context of the NBA as a whole. Um, ja does keep his sponsorship with Nike. Um, they came out and made a statement that they're – you know, happy that he's taken steps, you know, to correcting his behavior and going in the right direction. They're not going to cut ties with him, which he's very lucky for. Um, and I know we spent a lot of time on it, so we don't got to, you know, take up too much time here on the, this episode. But I know we both share the same sentiment that, like, look, we both hope that this is it, right? Like, you got to, got to, got to get it in check. Whatever it is, I'm not going to sit up here and speculate like a lot of people are because I don't know him. But whatever it is that's, you know, you got going on, what you're doing, you cannot keep doing this, bro. Because you are far too talented, far too marketable. Like people are like he legitimately can be the face of the NBA. Not ever saying that he's going to be the best player in the league, but from a marketability standpoint, from mm-hmm. a flashy standpoint, like he has everything a casual NBA fan wants. Oh, yes. He's about to he almost jump over Jakob Bertel. Almost or no, it was Kevin Love. He almost jumped over. He mm-hmm. dunked on, dunked on people every game. It looks like crazy highlights, flashy plays, like everything you could want in the face of the league. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is not helping. Like this is driving you further and further away from that. Um, so he's lucky to keep the Nike deal. Um, so yeah, look, whatever he does during this, this time off, I hope he takes his off season to really like sit and reflect and, and get right. Cause I can't imagine there's much of a leash after this. Yeah, um, that- Cause I, I feel like this goes outside of the NBA's hands at that point, because something like this, again, I feel like as an organization, the Grizzlies have to really take a look and be like, do we want to keep going down this path? Because, like, we're invested so much into you for you to keep doing this. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a slap in the face. So, 
at some point that comes into question before the NBA takes any action about other suspensions if this was to continue. So I'm hopeful that this is it and he's able to, to get himself right. Yeah, he needs to because all this stuff is easily avoidable. That's the, another thing. It's like you're not forced to do any of these things that you're doing. Like no one tells you to go in there and record yourself holding a gun. It's like you don't have to record anything you're doing no off the court. Like you don't have to do any of that stuff. So like I, I just feel like all of it is easily avoidable. And it's just you just need to make smart decisions. Like it's not hard to not play with a gun. It's not hard to not Honestly, stay away from Instagram Live in general, bro. Just Correct. don't do not go on IG Live ever. Don't go on IG Live, bro. Like you got enough clout, like you're good, bro. Like you're fine. You don't need to look cool for anybody. You're good, bro. Just play basketball. You can still have fun. No one's that and no one's saying you can't have fun. Like dudes like hey, just stay off the social. Bro, you're like twenty two years old. No one's mad at you for being in the club. Like no one bro, we just seen we seen NBA players do way crazier stuff off the court. No one's mad about that. Just don't record yourself doing anything stupid and just make smart decisions, bro. Like, you got a lot of bigger things for you. You got a lot of good opportunities going. Don't ruin that. It's that simple. Yeah. So, but I hope he gets it right because it's, it's too talented of a player for this to be how his career is, is panning out. Way right. too talented of a player. Mm-hmm. Um. Move on to, you know, lighter news. Um, Lemon Pepper Lou Williams has announced his retirement. Um, one of the greatest six men of all time. Um, I think probably really only behind Jamal Crawford, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I think it was he a three-time six man of the year winner. I, mean, mm-hmm. I got that right. Um, yeah, three-time six man of the year winner. Um, career 14 point per game score microwave badge on Hall of Fame for coming to a game and get hot. Um, long NBA career. Um, one of the uh, uh, last straight from high school to the NBA players um, in that, that 05 draft. Um, had a lot of good years um, in, in Atlanta um, with the Clippers as well. So uh, congrats to him on a, on a great career, um, being able to carve out, you know, a really, really great career and, and find a role there coming off the bench. Um, at only six one two, which is very very tough to do to have this long of a career at that height. So shout mm-hmm. out Lou Will. Yeah, it's a bucket, bro. So I gotta say, Lou Will has been a bucket. Contribute, like you said, contributed to a lot of teams. Gave a lot of teams great minutes. Came in off the come off the bench. I feel like I feel like those guys are the most like liked guys in the league. Those like six man of the year type mm-hmm. of guys. Like I don't know anyone that hates Jamal Crawford. I don't know anyone that hates Lou Will. I don't know anyone that hates, like, J.R. Smith. Like, those guys that, like, come off the bench, they want to come off the bench. Like, that's, like, their job. Yeah. I feel like those, that's, like, the – those they'll be, like, the coolest people in the league. Like, mm-hmm. like, it's like a backup quarterback, but, like, better. Like, you actually are, like, talented and play. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So, yeah, shout out to Lou Will, man. Yeah. So, more and more, like – I know I touched on it before, but, like, these vets who were, like – known for coming in and just like playing their role off the bench they're starting to retire it's getting harder and harder to find this stuff the league is getting young yeah it is i think we're really going to start to see vets like retiring earlier and earlier and like teams are just going to opt to say well what you can do we could bring in somebody that's 19 20 21 and like he might be able to give close to that level of production now but could develop to surpass that in a couple years so we'll just Mm -hmm. take the bet on that Unless, yeah. you know, it's like an immediate win now type of situation. So, um, yeah, another retirement here. So, so shout out Lou Will. Um, last thing that we want to get into today, um, we did this on the last pod with Michael Jordan. But today we're going to be building a team around a player who has championship aspirations, who <laughs> has been in rumors for Every season now for like the last three years, does he gonna does he want to leave? Is he gonna stay? Will they put a roster around him? Talking about Dame Dollar, Damian Lillard. So we're gonna put on our GM hats and construct a roster around Damian Lillard that will compete for a championship. Um, so what are the the stipulations on this one here today? All right, building a championship team around Damian Lillard. Same same rules as last time. We're gonna go Damian Lillard. We're gonna go one superstar, one all star, one role player, one rookie, all current players. Okay. So 
Um, again, you can have a first pick. I'll give it to you. Who is your superstar that you're gonna pair with Damian Lillard? Again, top ten to twelve ish player. Like we can just agree if they're a superstar or not. Like we'll yeah. we, we know. We don't gotta draw no hard line. But who is your superstar? You're you're gonna build around Damian Lillard. Give me Joel Embiid. Oh, explain that a little bit. I, that's okay. Okay. I like to fit there. A just because of how much. <clears throat> how dominant he is on the inside, right? How much he can contribute to um, on the defensive side of the ball um, as a, as a big, I think the two of them would pair really well in the pick and roll. Can you imagine having to guard a high screen anywhere, like 35 feet and in? Right. <laughs> Joel and Breed, Joel, Joel and B, Damian Lillard pick and roll. Like, what do you do? If you play a drop, you're getting torched. If mm-hmm. you come up and hedge, you're getting torched. If you try to ice it, you try to trap it, like you're getting torched. Like Facts. there's, I don't know what you're supposed to do uh, with a pick and roll between those two. Um, and then putting Joel on the block, just the amount of gravity that the two of them on the, the court at the same time would attract. Um, I, I think that, that would be a really good fit. Even in, you know, outside of this hypothetical, like Damian Lillard to Sixers have been rumored for a couple of months now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like that fit right now today so uh that, that's why i would, would take joel here i like it listen i think that's a great pick i mean obviously with the superstar you can't really go wrong but right. i, I love i love that fit actually my superstar i'm gonna go Giannis. and I like that too i just feel like to me i feel like this is the dream scenario like this is the dream duo for both of these guys like I just I think that they work together so well. I think that Giannis uh, is going to benefit from a guy who is a, a great of a, a perimeter scorer as Damian Lillard, who can stretch the floor as much as Damian Lillard, yep. and also a guy who can close games as well as Damian Lillard. Like I think he will benefit. We've seen big guys; they need a guy who can. Or they need a perimeter guy who can close games. Like Chris Middleton's been that closer for the Bucks. Obviously, he's not better than Giannis, but. You know, a big men really need that closer for them who can score from the perimeter. I think that Damian Lillard and Giannis would just work so perfectly together. Like I think that's a match made in heaven. So, mm-hmm. um, I, that listen, that was that was always gonna be my first pick. I just think they would work so well together. It'd be amazing. So, all right, um, we got our superstars out the way. Who is your all star that you're gonna pair with Damian Lillard? It's funny because I'm looking at the all star roster right now, and I'm like, dang, neither we could have paired Steph with Dame. We- <laughs> <laughs> that would have been crazy, bro. Try, try to guard them on the perimeter. Try, try to do that. That's it, man. That's crazy. People are gonna be doing cardio, <laughs> bro. Oh my god. Um, let me see. All star that I'm gonna pair with Damian Lillard, and this can't be it's like ten to twelve player. Yeah. So you know, keep that in mind. Hmm. Let me see here. Let me see here. All star that I'm gonna pair with Damian Lillard. Um, I took Jaron last time when we were talking about MJ with Damian Lillard. Already got him and Joel. I want somebody that can kind of <clears throat> play off the ball and bring something else to the maybe the defensive side of the court as well. Hmm. I'm stuck between two guys right now. Um, I think I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Jalen Brown. Mm, I was looking at that. Jaylen I like Brown. that. I like that a lot. I like that. I like the fit. Again, you put another guy in who can athletic is a is a good defender. Um. You know, doesn't need to have the ball in his hands, um, can play off ball some. Um, you know, in this type of offense where you have a guy like Dame and Joel, is going to be a lot of – have a lot of opportunity for open shots. Mm-hmm. Um, can knock it down, can attack closeouts, can create for himself if needed. Um, I shouldn't even say if needed. Can just create for himself, period. Right. Um, so, you know, I like, I like Jalen Brown here a lot, so. I got my little big three, Jalen, Dane, <laughs> and, and Joel. I like that. I like that a lot. So, 
what I was thinking, Jalen Brown definitely was an option for me. Uh, I think that would be a great fit. Um, I'm stuck between. Honestly, I'm not really. Stuck. I I, I kind of want to go Paul George here. Ooh, I, I like I think, PG. I think that'd be nice. He's he's a two way player. You know, I I like guys who could also play defense along with score. I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go Paul George. I'm gonna go Paul George. Tall, uh, yeah. lanky defender can handle the ball as well. Paul George has Paul George is up there as far as like he has some of the ability. best handles in the NBA. He's one of the most underrated skilled players I think in the NBA. Like does not get talked about how good of a – how smooth his ball handling is, his pull-up. Like, uh, he's got a bag. He wants to, like, bag yeah. debates back to her. He's got a bag. Uh, I've not get talked about enough. I've seen someone say that Paul George is, like, top three most skilled – like, offensively skilled players in the league, and I'm not opposed to that. Like I, I, I'm, I'm with that. I yeah, agree. Like, he is a very skilled offensive player. Like, yeah. So, yeah, I'm going a, I'm to a go Paul George for my all-star. Okay. So now we are going to do one role player. Who will your role player be? So you have so far you got Damian Lillard, you got Jalen Brown, you got Joel Embiid. Role player. I feel like this I is always the that. hardest one because it like you can you could go so anybody. many different ways. Yeah, like and I, now I'm see always... now I'm thinking all right, I got a role player and a rookie left. Really, for my my three and my four, or I could potentially go another guard and play Jalen at the three. But yeah, I'm trying to think. We got. Two spots left for a rookie and a role player. I'm not going to lie. I got somebody in mind. I don't know why this person came to mind, but it would fit. It would fit. Hmm. I'm going to actually – I'm going to take him. I'm going to go with Cam Johnson. I like that. I like okay. Cam Johnson. We, we're putting together some for real spacing. So Joel can operate down low with I'm gonna put nobody else down there. Mm -hmm. Um, but Cam Johnson again is another guy who can get to it on the defensive side of the ball as well. Mm -hmm. One of the best, you know, stretch the floor players um from we saw from his time in Phoenix and even from the time that he spent now in Brooklyn. Um, and I think he would pair really nicely with Damian Lillard um in the coil I'm putting together there. So yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with Cam Johnson. Okay. I like that. I definitely like that. If I'm being completely honest with you, I have no idea who I'm about to pick for my role player. Um, man, this is hard because I think that your team is a little bit more versatile than mine, strictly because Giannis can't freaking shoot. Like this guy cannot shoot to save his life. So. Hmm, which is tough. So, all right, this, this is my problem. This is what I'm looking at. There's a lot of great role players who are bigs, but not a lot of them can space the floor enough to have Giannis on the court with them. And I don't want to pick Brook Lopez again because I picked him last time. So, I'm mm -hmm. not trying to like just mimic and pick the same guy. Because honestly, <laughs> if, I, if I just wanted to, I could pick Brooke, Brooke Lopez as my role player every single time. Yeah. <laughs> If we're not having like uh if we're not building around a center uh, Jokic, yeah, if we're not yeah. building around Jokic and beating all them, I could pick uh what's the name? Brooke Lopez every single time. So what I'm gonna do is hmm I'm trying to think who's a good big that can space the floor. Let me look at all the teams in the NBA real quick. Hmm. I could go I could go like super small and just put like a and run like a small ball lineup. Is Porzingis considered a role player or is he too good? I think he's too good to be a role okay. player. He's the number one option. That is that is true. That is very, very true. Might have picked Wimby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wimby, you can space the floor for me. Um, nah, but I'm gonna go. Oh my god, this is tough. Oh, this is tough. You know what? I think I'm gonna go. I think I might go super small. 
Matter of fact, no, I'm not. Whatever. You know what? I'll go small ball, and I'll put this guy in my five, or put this guy in my four, slide Giannis in my five. We're just going to run small ball a little bit. This might be – this guy's old. Am I bugging for thinking of picking Kevin Love? Nah. Am I bugging? Like, he can space the floor. I just, I really just want somebody who can space the floor, but who's also a big, and I don't want to pick Brooke Lopez again. Yeah. I really don't. You know what? Whatever, bro. It is what it is. I'll pick. I'll pick Kevin Love. That'd be my okay. role player. Okay. Okay. Yo, so who's on your team right now? You got? I got Dame, Paul George, Giannis, Kevin Love. Okay. He gonna hurt me on the defensive end. though. I ain't even gonna lie. And he like a hundred and five years old. But <sighs> it is. It is what it is. So oh. now you got to pick your rookie, and I got to pick my rookie. I got a couple of people in mind. I got a couple of people in mind. Um, hmm. I'm looking at a guy like Tari Eason. I'm looking at a guy like Jeremy Sohan or even J Dub. I took J Dub last time, right? Or I took Matherin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I took J Dub. You took J Dub. Um, then really okay. I don't want to pick the same people again, so I'm gonna go. Shoot, maybe I'll take Matthew in there. I don't want to mess with the spacing I got though, so maybe I don't take Sohan here. He still got ways to go to develop as a shooter. Or Easton is already a 34% shooter. Like what he brings on the defensive side of the ball. Um. Hmm. Um, Tari Eason or J Dub? I'm gonna go Tari Eason. I'm gonna go Tari Eason. I like what he could bring a little bit better on the defensive side of the ball. Um, second this past year among all rookies in, in steals. Um, okay, I, I like that. I like that. So I'm gonna go. So my full team now is Damian Lillard at the one, Jalen Brown at the two, Tari Eason at the three, Cam Johnson at the four, and then Joel Embiid at the five. I like that. I like, that. I like that. I like that team a lot. I definitely like that team a lot. Mm. <laughs> you know what was funny? <laughs> I was thinking to be like, is it okay if I pick Chet Holmgren and not pick Kevin Love? But he ain't play, so I ain't gonna do that. I just thought that was funny. Um, so what do I need? I have so I have Damian Lillard, Paul George, Giannis, Kayla. So I need a two. So I, I can slide. I can slide Paul George to the three. Mm-hmm. I could slide Paul George to the three. Or he could he could play the two. What do you what do you consider Paul George at? This is like not even this list. What do you consider him as? Because I feel like when he came into the league, he was a two. He was a two. He's kind of transitioned to be in a three, just the way that everything is kind of progressing. I mean, some nights he probably could play the four. Like it positions really are like they do not it's matter positionless. anymore. Yeah. It is positionless. You know what? So I listen, I like this guy a lot, bro. I like this guy a lot. I might take a page out of your book and what you did last time and go J Dub. Listen, I he, like J Dub. He could plug and play into a lot of different lineups with his skill set, bro. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm gonna do. You know, what? I'm gonna go J Dub. I like that. J Dub. So, all right, <clears throat> your team around Damian Lillard is Damian Lillard, Jalen Brown, Tari Eason, Cam Johnson, Joel Embiid. My team is Damian Lillard, J Dub, Paul George, Kevin Love, Giannis. Y'all let us know who got the better team. Giannis at the five is tough. It's, listen, I I had to do what I had to do, man. I think I could have picked the, I, I could have picked another center, but the way Giannis plays, but I feel like he has to play with somebody who can space the floor. Like I just no, 100%, feel like, yeah. Like he, he's he's got to have a runway. Yeah, he he's not one of them guys that could just make it work and play with a, another inside center. So that that was what was making it tough for me, man. I was making it tough. But I guess we're going to, in a world of versatility, small ball, we just seen the Miami Heat got 6'9", bam, playing center. I'm in the finals, out. right, yeah. I'm just gonna go out. We gonna, Giannis is seven foot tall. We're going to play team defense. We got Kevin Love taking them charges. Oh, Kevin yeah. Facing the floor. You know Outlet that pass is going to be crazy, yeah. <laughs> Bro, crazy. Oh, my God. Got J-Dub and Paul George in the wing. Got Damian Lillard facing the floor. I like I like that team a lot. If I'm being unbiased, 
I might like your team a little bit more, if I'm being honest. With Damian Lillard, Tari Eason, Jenna, I like I I might like your team a little bit more. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a huge Cam Johnson fan. Yeah, I love Cam, Cam Johnson, Johnson. I, bro. Literally, I'm literally just like trying to think through role players. And I feel like my mind always starts with like Alex Caruso. Next name that <laughs> popped in my head was Cam Johnson, and I could not. I was like, that's a good fit. Like I like yeah. I like how that works. So. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So I like I like the teams though. This is a, I like this. Yo, know, these these are so these, much fun. I like doing math these. fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> I like doing these a lot. Yeah, but we are a little over twenty four hours. This is like we're maybe thirty hours away from the draft tomorrow night. Um, I know on Saturday's pod uh, we're gonna have a lot to react to, yeah. praise or not, because like we said, after women Yama, the draft starts and. Latest report I saw this morning still is that the Hornets love Brandon Miller, love the second where they brought him and school in for second workouts. And um, they're still, I think, pretty set on Brandon Miller now. But that all could be smoke and mirrors because they could have been set on school months ago, just trying to shake up the pot, which is what we saw last year with it was you didn't it could have been Chad. It could have been. You know, Jabari Smith was predicted to go to Orlando for a little bit, and then out of mm-hmm. nowhere, right before the draft started, Orlando had his mindset on Paolo, which they yeah. probably knew for a long time, but it's good to keep people guessing. 100%. Um, so who knows where, where Charlotte goes, but that's the draft starts at 2. Um, at the number 2 pick tomorrow night, starts at 7 o'clock Eastern, so excited for the draft, and I'm excited to react to uh, – all the picks and hopefully potential trades that, that come tomorrow um, on Saturday's pod. So with that, that's going to do it for this episode of the off the glass podcast. As always, if you made it this far, we appreciate you. Um, go ahead and leave a like comment, subscribe to the channel. Um, if you are on YouTube, if you're on Apple podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and leave a five-star review and set the podcast to download. Um, we appreciate the support a ton as always. I'm Billy and that's Dame and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.